Has the current political environment altered your views on gun control or guns? In my personal opinion, I think the current environment for guns is a really interesting one. With all the influences that are impacting our community now, you have the coronavirus effect, you have people who are concerned about the economy, and of course there is a presidential election. It's creating a perfect opportunity for people who are affiliated in the gun industry. I think this year gun sales will probably shatter pre-existing records. In periods of uncertainty, people want something to make them feel comfortable. Hmm. It's almost like when the pandemic broke out. What was the number one item everyone was buying? Guns. Uh, no, toilet paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted that one piece of comfort that they had that one thing settled. We've moved on, and now people are thinking, well, what's next? And as part of that what next scenario that exists in a lot of people's minds, some people think, there might be civil unrest. Some people think that there might be shortages of essential goods. And some people think that, well, we might have some social Darwinism that hmm. takes place and that there might be a battle for resources. And some people are concerned with how to survive in that era and keep their families safe. And yes, guns is at the top of the list and we are shattering gun records and the numbers of people who are applying for concealed pistol licenses. We're going to keep growing and we're going to keep doing well. I'm just glad to be a part of it. It's a great time to be hmm. a firearms instructor. Interesting. A great time. It seems that we're closer to more gun control in the liberal, in the leftist, the progressive sort of sense, in the sense of taking away guns. It seems like the demographics of the voters, my millennial generation coming up, is more inclined to take guns. Is that incorrect? That seems to be my sense of things. When you look at the number of guns that are already in circulation and the number of guns that are being sold and records are being bought, there's always going to be guns in our society. Hmm. Even if certain elections go a certain way and gun banners eventually get in control and try to enact gun laws and try to take guns away from those who want to keep their guns, I don't know. Would people with guns peaceably give them up or are we headed for another revolution. I don't know. I know that I'm not giving my gun up. <laughs> what did it say? Come and take it, man. What's that guy? Moses. He played Moses, the actor. Tom Heston. Uh, out of my cold, dead Out of my <laughs> cold, dead hands. Come and take it. We have more guns than we have citizens. Yeah, we do. Legal citizens. No. <laughs> <laughs> another topic, another day. Legal guns or guns in general? Would it be true if you snapped your finger and all guns in homes in America disappeared, you could probably get a metal detector and find them underground. Like, there's so many in America. We've got a glut of... There are of guns everywhere, man. We were founded on a revolution. We actually went to war. We ostensibly were arguing over tax on tea, the Boston Tea Party, right? That led to the Revolutionary War. We were founded with guns. Yes, sir. Speaking of history, to that point, was there ever a specific turning point in American history where gun laws and opinions on gun ownership started going into the realm of the insane. Was there a certain incident like Columbine or a shooting or anything where things started to change? I don't know if there's been any one incident, man. There's this perpetual battle that seems to be waged. We're currently in the latest stage of the latest iteration of this battle. There are people who believe in freedom and ways to safeguard freedom and with guns. The First Amendment was so that we could air our grievances to our government. And the Second Amendment was when they start ignoring us and start taking away our rights and freedoms, then the Second Amendment gives you an opportunity to affect that or to change that. You have all the other rights that are eliminated in the Bill of Rights. This battle will continue to wage as long as we exist as a country. Hmm. The latest environment we find ourselves in now, the pro-gun side, not telling you, by what's actually happening on the ground, we're winning because people who were previously anti-gun and they're looking at their environment and they're looking at what's happening with the civil unrest, they're concerned about their safety. And man, they are glad that they can walk into a gun shop and buy a gun and take it home and feel more secure. I predict that for now, the pro-gun side is gonna do well until mm. we get overconfident and lax and then let these anti-gunners pick up steam. But it's a perpetual battle that will never end and I'm in it for the long haul. From Ronald Reagan, off quoted quote, 
Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass freedom on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same, or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in the United States where men were free. Could you comment to that? Yeah, and you know what, and I can relate it directly to myself. When I was robbed at gunpoint in front of my yes, house, yes. I was not anti-gun, but I wasn't really pro-gun either. I had a 12-gauge shotgun at home just in case someone broke in and I could defend my home. I wasn't really thinking about guns. Not until that one fateful night I was robbed at gunpoint by two people who looked like younger versions of me in my mm. driveway. Mm. that I said, well, let me take a look at this whole Second Amendment gun ownership concealed pistol license thing. The one thing that I keep turning back to is that even though at that time that I was robbed, victimized in my driveway, I was not a fervent Second Amendment supporter, I am so glad that that right, that that ability for me to be able to go get a gun still was there. Yeah. You know, I had that right, I never exercised it, but I am so glad that that right was still there so I could pick it up, exercise it, and use it when my thoughts and feelings changed. And being robbed at gunpoint in my own driveway, it changed my heart, it changed my mind. And for that very reason, which is why I'm an advocate for gun ownership in the Second Amendment, hmm. even for people who are anti-gun right now, just in case one day something happens, they have a change of heart, they still have this right that they can turn to, adopt it, and pick it up and be the next generation to fight for freedom. So. I get it, and I truly understand the quote. I am glad that the Second Amendment was there when I decided to embrace it. I'm going to do the same for people in the future. I know you're focused on the Second Amendment. With my limited knowledge, I would say it's quite unique among the world, among governments, the language of it, what it gives us. And in the same way, I think the First Amendment, maybe even more so, or at least on level with the Second Amendment, is a very unique thing to America and a blessed freedom and liberty that we have to practice religion, pract you know, to say things. <laughs> This is Detroit. This is what happens in Detroit. You know, no, but um, elsewhere around the world, are there better laws than the Second Amendment? Is the Second Amendment the gold standard? In the world today, the Second Amendment is the gold standard in the world. We are the gold standard for a lot of things. We're the gold standard for economy. We're the gold standard for business. We're the gold standard for personal protection, freedom, and guns. It is the reason why people risk their lives daily to get here hmm. and to come here. And we're born here. Many of us don't really appreciate because there are a lot of things that we so readily and easily take for granted. But you know what? I am proud to be an American. I'm proud to be a Michiganian. Proud to hmm. be a Detroiter, man. You know, wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Same here. Florida's warm, but it's also humid. They also have hurricanes and snakes, and I don't like Gators. snakes. <laughs> all pythons, sorts of things. Pythons. Pythons. Yeah. Which all weren't even native. They're all pets. sorts of things. And here, our deadly winters are deadly to the. <laughs> winters are brutal here, man. Some are not so bad. Some are relatively mild but even in a mild winter there's a stretch of a couple of weeks where it gets pretty bad you know what still wouldn't want to be anywhere else the worst thing we have to worry about is the brutal cold and the brutal winters we don't have mudslides we don't oh yeah good point we do have tornadoes every once in a while but we don't have hurricanes and we don't have earthquakes when you consider everything it's a good place to live man. yes sir if you had a private audience with the mayor of detroit the governor governor of Michigan or the president of the United States. This is both a timely and a timeless question in the sense of the current occupants or maybe the future occupants. What would your elevator pitch be to quickly talk about what you think is important, what they should hear from you? Man, have the audience with the most important elected officials here in the city, the state, and in the nation. Wow, that's a lot of influence in just one conversation. I would stick true to my principles. I'm all for freedom. I'm pro-gun. I would want our rights to be respected. We also have our challenges locally here in the city of Detroit. Seems like for the duration of my life, we've always had problems financially. Hmm. I'd like to see what it is that we could do to put us on firm ground, make us financially solvent and stable. The state of Michigan seemed to be doing well with this latest iteration with the pandemic some of the things that we've done with the shutdowns, I'm scared.
scared to even look at the balance sheets right now, man. We may have to get bailed out by the federal government. The federal government, we're having our problems. We're spending a ton of money, spending money by the trillions. The average person doesn't even know how many zeros are in a trillion, right? We passed up every war, Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War I, World War II, and just this year we outspent accounting for inflation. The debt to GDP ratio during World War II was better than it is now, and we're not in a war, let alone a world war. We're in uncharted territory in terms of our fiscal handling of the budget and money. Yes. I'll say this. Yes, sir. We're Americans, man, and we'll find a way to survive, and yes, we'll sir. find a way to be great, man. Back to the topic of guns. I want to stick to your specialty. What separates a good gun owner from a bad gun <laughs> owner? <laughs> Many ways you can come I, I, at that. You know that. what? That's a very easy topic, man. Interesting. Uh, a good gun owner is a gun owner who, one, is a safe gun owner. You know how to safely operate your gun and properly maintain it such that you don't present a threat to yourself or anyone in your area when you're carrying it. And two, you actually know and understand the law so that you don't run afoul of them. There are over 20,000 gun laws in the United States. It's easy to blow a couple of them if you're not paying attention. Hmm. Bad gun owners, they don't know their guns, they don't know their firearms, and they don't know the law. And they use guns in situations that do not call for guns. They make the rest of us gun owners look bad by extension because we have this one bad example that's being bandied about and popular in social media as to why guns are bad rather than saying that this person is the exception and the aberration rather than the normal. That's beautiful. So education, it seems, is key. Yeah, for sure, man. One of the things about guns and gun ownership is that guns is one of those things that, in terms of education, that has been lost socially. There was a time in this country where every person learned about guns at the best place possible, and that was at home. Interesting. Your parents were gun owners. They taught gun history, they taught gun rights, and they taught gun safety. You could leave a gun on the kitchen table, and the kids, they would not touch it because they have been properly trained. In some places, we're closet gun owners. We try <laughs> to keep it a secret. We try to hide the guns. We don't talk to the kids about the guns. The kid finds it. And in isolated incidents, which are steadily decreasing every year, hmm. a kid finds it and something bad happens. Well, no, it's not the kid's fault. It's your fault. Hmm. It's not necessarily because you didn't lock it up. It's because you didn't teach your children about guns and gun safety and how not to bother that and to respect it and to give it the value and the reverence that it deserves. We teach our kids not to cut on the stoves, not to put their hand in fire, not to jump in the swimming pool. Hey, we can certainly do the same thing with guns. Both and, not either or. Yes. You're very perceptive. <laughs> you hold on to the truth no yeah. matter what is going on around you. And I, I noticed right. that's very good for an educator and especially for a firearm educator to not be distracted. Focus, man. Where does that come from in you? And do you teach that to other people or how do you teach in general? Well, I like to be the expert. I don't want to be a generalist. I don't want to be a person who is fully conversational on all topics. No, I have no interest in all of that. My focus, my calling, my mission is gun rights and empowering people to take on a more active role in their personal protection and empowering our fellow citizens to be on guard against tyranny. That's mm. my focus, man. Everything else, eh. It's small potatoes. You are an educator. So yes. what does that entail? Because there are several different disciplines that people could be teaching other people yeah. about. Well, I mean, there's so much stuff to teach. But I mean, if we were talking about just strictly guns. Yes, sir. You know, my field of expertise, I'm a National Rifle Association Credential Firearms Trainer. My credentials are pistol, rifle, shotgun, personal protection, one, personal protection, two. I teach people how to clean their firearms. I teach people how to be firearms instructors. Doctors, chief brain safety officers. <laughs> You're a that's, teacher of the teachers. That, I'm a teacher of teachers. Wow. I teach people to be firearms instructors. I'm also a teacher in history and with hmm. respect to gun laws and gun rights and how we got to this place with all these 20,000 gun laws that are on the books. I like to go out and speak. Where we met, I did a speech before a group out not too long ago. It might have been maybe two years now, right? Where time goes when we're having fun. Yes, sir. But I do a lot of public speaking in front of a lot of different groups because there is a constant need to educate people in our communities of our rights and where they came from and how we actually have these infringements upon our rights. I do it all to preserve the right to hmm. keep and bear arms for another generation. I have my rights now, but 
I want these rights to exist for my children and for my grandchildren, and so I have to do my part. You're planting trees you'll never be able to see fully grown. True. That's beautiful. It's one thing to be aware of the issues, it's another thing to act on them, and it's a whole other thing on top of that, be gifted enough to do it well and to go beyond your own life, your own scope, and just out of the kindness within you to help other people that you'll never see. Are you familiar with just war theory, with the writing of uh, Augustine? Oh, I must say I'm not, but just, you know what? I'll take a peek at it. Just war theory, uh, this is about 1700 or so years ago. At the very end of the Roman Empire, as the empire was actually crumbling, as the barbarians were literally at the gates of the city, this man named Augustine was writing about just war theory, about a lot of things, but that was one of them. The concept in short is to be peaceful, but if you are in danger, to defend yourself, mm -hmm. a defensive war, as opposed to a more offensive. Uh, it's been used in Christianity ever since then. Augustine, one of the premier church fathers, Christian theologians, and the American ethos follows just war theory, and I think it even applies to the micro level, not the whole nation, but even down to individual basis. When is it appropriate to use force in what way we talked earlier in the other location about brandishing right how does an encounter go down we're in detroit right now yeah. and someone hey man you got any money you know like you know someone's being yeah. maybe they're yeah there are some very specific rules of engagement that must be known and adhered to man and there's a lot of different cases a lot of people are talking about but here in the state of michigan it's fairly relatively simple hmm. as long as you're somewhere you have a legal right to be we're out in public park plaza. Yes, sir. We're not committing a crime, right? Yes, sir. I don't think we're doing anything <laughs> that anyone would find criminally objectionable. Yes, sir. If some set of circumstances were to materialize such that a reasonable person would feel that we are in imminent danger of great bodily harm, sexual assault, or death, then we can use lethal force hmm. without a duty to retreat. I don't have to try to run and get away first. I don't have to engage in a lot of other things instead of defending myself. And then I think it's great. A lot of times people, they get away from looking at each individual word of the law. They're all important. Hmm. When you talk about imminent, what does imminent mean? Imminent means right here, right now. It doesn't mean later or down the road. It means right now. Imminent. Danger. Well, hmm. danger of what? It's just three things. Death, great bodily harm or rape. Anything else? No, you're not justified. I get the feeling from you. There's so much depth. It takes repeat viewing. Folks watching at home, if you don't get it, go to Detroit CCW. There's so much. This It's so dense. There's so man, much to it. I have it. over 2,200 videos on YouTube and still growing, man. It's a very large conversation. It shows that you're a specialist on the topic. It also shows just from this talk that there's a lot of learning to do. It's continual and it's perpetual. Every incident provides another learning learning example look let's look at what happened uh, what were the facts what's the law how could it have been done better how can we do better in the future so mm. I'm constantly looking for examples because the people I talk to I know that they're watching those examples if I can take those examples and use them as training tools that will enable the message to stay with them longer you got a vision I love it <laughs> it's, it's right? fascinating last week I was talking to a friend of mine here in the city my brother just went I think today actually he's going to get eight hour class to have okay. Uh, a concealed oh. pistol license class. You're right. Maybe I should ask him where he went and see if it was a good place compared, you know, to what well, you know. You know what? Like anything else, man, there's there's good places to go and there's places that are, you know, not so good. And that's a very important thing to know about to get right or get wrong. I'm here in Detroit and I've had some close calls with violence. I think it's maybe smart in the long run for me to get a weapon. I've got knives, but you aptly said if you pull a knife, they're just going to pull a gun possibly and then you're done. Well, you know what? I, and I've talked about this on social media the other day. If a person has a knife, they can kill you. You could literally be stabbed to death even if you have a gun. When I first worked in Detroit, the very first day I started on the job, you show up early, want to impress the boss. Mm -hmm. Gotta come to work on time. Right? There's a homeless guy sleeping in front of the door. And so we're like, uh, uh, sir, we're opening our business up. Could you please go somewhere else? This mm -hmm. is where people are going to be walking place of work, place of business. And he's like, no, man, I'm sleeping here. It's so like, no, you, know, you, you gotta leave. The guy pulls out a knife. So my... And my both run into the door behind the guy. My comes out with a crowbar. My comes out with a cricket bat and they shoo the guy off. But that was my first experience here in Detroit, you know, and I've had many since. I want to get a gun. I was talking to a friend of mine and he said, Ryan, 
weapons attract trouble. You're going to be a magnet for trouble. I'm like, well, not necessarily. It's, it's concealed. I don't know. Like, what, what do you, what do you think? Is it is it wise? Are firearms magnets for trouble. Yeah. Man, I don't think so. I carry a gun every single day, man. Trouble just does not magnetically get attracted to me. I think it's far more important in terms of your demeanor, your behavior. Interesting. Your actions in places that you go. I typically don't go where bad people are. I don't put myself at greater risk for trouble. I don't go hanging out at night. I don't go by myself and try to walk through a crowd of strangers on a dark evening. I know the law. I'd carry my gun. I stay to myself. I stay out of the way. If someone was to bump me, yeah, it would be nice if they said, excuse me, but you know what? I'm not going to risk an altercation. I'm just going to keep it moving. Hmm. Get to my destination. I'm not going to engage in petty arguments and disputes. My rules of engagement are very simple. What's that? Death, great bodily harm, or sexual assault. Other than that, I'm keeping it moving. I gotta remember that. When I'm editing this, I'm an advantage over the audience. I get to go over your words again and again and learn <laughs> as I'm editing this down. I love what's ahead for me. I used to think if someone tried to mug me or something, I would stand there and fight them. Hearing about what happens sometimes to people, fight or flight, I think I'd rather run away from trouble than stand and fight, unless if they were just gonna pummel me and give me brain damage, I'm gonna be like a rat against the wall and you gotta fight or else, you know, something bad's gonna happen to you. But I'm more in the school of run away from danger. And it sounds like you're just avoid danger, I'm you like, know? Avoid it. And if you can't avoid it, if possible, you could leave the area. As a matter of fact, if you could do so safely, it's probably advisable. I wouldn't want it to be the law, but I would mm. still want it to be discretionary. It's just like what you said before, your start with guns is you are thankful that you had the option. Mm -hmm. That's part of the beauty of freedom. You don't know what you don't know. It's sort of like uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Known, <laughs> known knowns, unknown right. unknowns. Unknown, unknowns, unknowns, right. We're accidentally falling upon a theme here with Reagan, you know, freedom. Is, right. it, we want to maintain this. Right. You never know what's going to happen. You just have to be prepared for everything. In terms of what you know, what you don't know, you go with what you have. I'm glad that I have the right to carry a gun. I wouldn't be so bold as to require people who don't like guns to make them carry guns. Some people say, well, hey, I, you know what? I'd rather use my fists and fight. Okay, well, great. That's hmm. the choice that you made. But what if that person is a senior citizen, is elderly, or maybe that person is handicapped, has a disability. Maybe this person is really short, really small. Maybe this person is a woman, is not as physically strong. We're basically advocating for survival of the fittest, where the strong, Interesting. Where the strong can punish and exact misery upon the weak at will just because of pure, you know, they, they won the genetics lottery. Interesting. And I don't think that that's the case, man. I think that everyone should be protected. Everyone should have the right to be left alone. Everyone hmm. should not be raped. Everyone hmm. should be safe and secure. And guns are the perfect equalizer.